Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today is an interview I'm really looking forward to because we're going to go into some molecular biology, NAD pathways, anti-aging, and some things that are pretty interesting around how we can have this precious molecule in the body, and it's not probably what you think it is. Our guest is Dr. Nicola Conlon, who's a scientist who got really frustrated between the lag time between discovering something and then getting new supplements or drugs out to consumers. It takes about 15 years when scientists go, oh, we know this works, and the really adventurous ones are like using it on themselves, and then you and me, we get access to it after we've wasted 15 years of lower performance and not feeling as good. It's something that really, really pisses me off, (laughs) to be honest. I, I think we have a fundamental right to buy whatever molecules we want, whether or not we have a permission slip from a government. And this is why you can buy almost whatever you want. You just have to buy it from another country. And it's ridiculous. So what Nicola did, she took her molecular biology background and early stage drug discovery work that she'd done. And she founded a company called Nuchito. And she's the CEO of it. So she brought in a team of scientists and they said, all right, how do we do multivariate analysis to figure out, because Maybe it's more than one thing that's going to give you the results you want, which is also is something that makes me happy. There is no reason, no reason whatsoever to believe one thing is going to fix you or one thing is going to be what it is going to be the magic bullet, but that's what all drug discovery is about, the one compound. But you might need 10 compounds to get the results you want, and that's what anti-aging and functional medicine is about. So we got someone who came from the dark side who is now saying, all right, how do I just make stuff that works, whatever has to be in there, and get it out there so That's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome to the show, Nicola. Hi, Dave. It's really great to be here. And uh, thanks for the lovely introduction. Uh, You are welcome. Uh, What did I get wrong in that introduction? I mean, you've done a lot of interesting stuff, but. Not much, actually. I think that was a pretty good summary um, of of where I've come from. I am. I mean, my my background is, is a very academic route. So very traditional I mean, I've always been just fascinated by the body and um, how it works, just everything just that makes us tick. It's just so fascinating. And that led me down this academic route of trying to learn more and more about it. Um, I did my background was in um, molecular biology. I did a degree, a master's. I went on and did a PhD um, where I specialized in in bioavailability so how when you take a a drug or a supplement or a nutrient or anything like that how does it get into the cells um, and actually perform its function Um, but the issue for me really was in in academia just as you've hit the nail on the head before um, in science it's like all of science is is encapsulated in this bubble where it never actually gets out to real people in the outside world um, and for me, that was really frustrating because I just wanted to talk about it and nobody knew what I was talking about half the time because it was just not available knowledge. And the other thing that was really frustrating was that in academia, you tend to focus on like this tiny little bit of science. So you, you spend your life working on a gene or a protein or a pathway at the most and you just block out the rest of biology, which is this huge thing, which is for me was crazy. It's like, that is a crazy idea to just ignore everything else and focus on one tiny little piece. Um, so that really didn't sit right with me. What are some of the drugs that you worked on? So when I was working on PhD and things like that, we were looking more about the bioavailability. So looking at joining things like peptides to drugs to help with their absorption. So to trick the gut into absorbing them and then releasing the peptide and then actually releasing the the active molecule. Um, When I actually then moved into drug development, I was working on immunotherapies. um, So the more cutting edge um, cancer treatments um, and also things to do with with neurodegeneration. Um, But but naively, when I, I went into drug development, I thought that was my opportunity to, you know, not just focus on one thing and focus on um, multiple diseases and multiple pathways, but how how wrong I was, (laughs) actually. (laughs) The the deeper I dig, uh, the more I understand that that much of the thinking that we've had in the last hundred years is very high level. And if you get down further and further and further, like there's systems in here that affect everything and you can affect those systems. And of course, 
Alzheimer's and Parkinson's risk is going to go down. But if all you care about is Alzheimer's, you just would never even notice. And of course, if you fix diabetes, your risk of cancer and heart disease goes down. But if you're doing heart disease, you're not going to look at diabetes. And it's always confounded me. But as I unpacked my own biology, uh, I just keep going lower and lower into these really basic mechanisms of life. And you're like, make those better and everything else just fixes itself. Is that a good way of thinking about it? Yeah. I mean, you know, you can understand why scientists do pick apart tiny little bits, because if you really want to understand something, you have to do that. But I think the bit that generally that we're really bad at is actually piecing it all together and looking at the wider picture and actually what, what is going on at a, at a higher level, like you say. Um, I think that is something that is is almost has a blind eye turn to it. And that's a key example in, in drug development. So that still to this day, they're just absolutely, you know, set on just having this magic bullet approach of, oh, there's a gene or a protein that's involved in a disease. So let's get a drug and stick to it and we'll knock it out and we'll cure the disease. And that never happens because biology is so complex. And also drugs don't stick to one thing. The promiscuous molecules, they have a huge footprint. So you get off target effects. And also generally you just have a really, really poor hit rate when you're, you're trying to develop any new molecules. Why is drug development so slow? Or frankly, new supplement development, but let's talk about drugs first because that's where you, came, where you came from before you're like, I could do supplements. Um, what's taking us 10 or 15 years? Well, exactly that approach because the, the, we, I would refer to it as like a reductionist approach. It's, it's again, it's just looking at these tiny little parts of, of biology, which is incredibly complex and you can't look at tiny little parts. And because they're still really focused and ignore the fact that there's this complex biology going on and ignore the fact that drugs stick to multiple things, you get a lot of things that simply don't do what you expect them to do when they go in the body because the body's highly redundant. It has lots of other different pathways and processes that will regulate when you try and knock one thing out. And then also um, the drugs are sticking to things and having all these side effects. So the hit rate of actually looking at finding new molecules that actually work is like way less than a percent. So that, you know, like one in every 10,000. So it's just finding. So, so it's the screening time is the, but once you identify one, it still takes 10 years to get it to market. If you're lucky, right? Why does it take so long after? Oh, look, I found something that works. Why do we take 10 years? And that's, that's where the, the complexity and all the red tape comes in. You know, it's it's all of the, um, the the phases that everything has to go through in a very specific order, uh, you know, a phase one, a phase two, then a phase three. And they were all done like one after the other. But I think, you know, actually, what if there's one good thing that's come out of COVID <laughs> that is demonstrated is how quickly that you can actually get a drug or a vaccine or something to market if you have to by running phases in parallel, by actually not just focusing on single molecules and having multiple eggs in your basket at the same time and, you know, working on them in um, parallel. So I think that's one good thing to be learned. Well, I am terribly offended that we just spent all that money and time uh, fast tracking the vaccine for COVID, but we haven't fast tracked any of the 15 anti-aging drug candidates because I hate to tell you old age has killed at least half the people who died from COVID because they were already on death's door and it kills way more people than COVID every single year because people die. And usually it's the chronic diseases of aging. So we can't fast track those, but we can fast track this. Maybe we could just fast track all drugs or better yet, just say, here's all the studies. You want to buy this new research compound? You can buy it. By the way, that's what I do. <laughs> I do buy research compounds. Uh, but it's it's a ridiculous, a ridiculous thing. If you're dying of a disease or you have really severe diabetes and you want to try something new, it is your God-given right. And when any government on the planet says, oh, we're not going to let you do it because it might not be safe, it's like, who do you think you are? I don't know. Am I too radical? I did. <laughs> well, you know, not not at all. Um, I, I completely agree. And this this is exactly what I was so frustrated by. I was so frustrated so, so for example, part of my job working in a drugs company was we would test a list of molecules in the lab, you know, maybe a thousand compounds. I'd get a list back that said in order of best to worst, which ones worked, which ones didn't. And then what I would have to do is look at which ones you could patent. So which ones had freedom to operate around them. 
Um, and drugs companies do this because they will not take forward the development of a drug that is going to cost, you know, hundreds of millions in 10 to 15 years if they cannot absolutely own it outright and have exclusivity to it. So commercially, I get why they do it. But ethically, I would be sitting there looking at compounds that worked really, really well, but were actually, un, you know, weren't considered patentable because they were natural molecules. They were things that were really common already, things that were safe as supplements, things that had GRAS approval. And they were just getting put in the bin, along with this amazing data that showed actually this, those things work better than the drugs that they're going to spend hundreds of millions on. So for me, that was a big eye opener. I get it. And as a person with a Wharton MBA, if you can own it, <laughs> you do make a lot more money. There's a reason that pharmaceutical companies own a lot of the governments out there, um, not the other way around. And you look at supplements. Uh, well, let's see. I'm the guy who made collagen a big thing. You can't own collagen, right? I know how to make it in a certain way so it doesn't taste like socks. Uh, but there's lots of knockoffs you know, of all sorts of different grades. And the deal is it works. And every supplement company out there has dealt with this. You can get some patents and I've got patents on some of the things I've formulated, but it means you can't copy the same thing. So what people do is, oh, I'll just make the same thing and add vitamin C there. Now it's different. And so in the supplement business, it's simply less profitable than pharmaceuticals, but I think it helps a lot more people. And that's why the pharmaceutical industry keeps trying to shut down supplement companies because they compete with pharmaceutical companies. And of course, pharmaceutical companies, they like nothing better than a monopoly. I, I don't know why. Yeah. And, and that is exactly why I found in Cheeto. That is our mission. It is to take the cutting edge science and also our expertise in how you find molecules or combinations of molecules that actually work in the body and then actually sort of cut out all that complex stage and get them as over the counter products where people can benefit from them now, but they actually have scientific credibility behind them, good scientific thoughts, some testing um, so, so it was really a try and bring that in, into the world, which I know you're obviously really passionate about as well. Now you're using an approach called systems pharmacology, uh, which came out of big pharma, but you're using it for natural compounds. Explain what that is. Yeah. So systems pharmacology was something I was really lucky to learn about, well, but probably back in about 2015 when I'd realized that a uh, big pharma still has this approach of the magic bullet. Um, and I was looking like, seriously, does anyone have a better way to do this? Um, and I came across a company which specialized in systems pharmacology. And basically what systems pharmacology is, is like three main principles, which make it different to conventional pharmaceutical discovery. And the three main things are, is that it respects the fact that actually biology is really, really complex. And there is a lot going on and it is very robust. It's built to withstand impact generally. And it doesn't ignore that. It actually respects the fact that there's this complexity. And when looking at diseases or conditions or whatever it is that you want to treat, it actually looks at the whole picture and not just a, a single protein or a single gene. It actually looks at every single gene, every single pathway, every single protein, every single feedback, feed forward, you know, inhibition, everything that is going on and, and almost looks at it as a big network. That's what we, we, we call it as. And then the second principle is, is just bearing in mind this complexity is that it is never, ever scientifically plausible to take a single target approach because it's just a stupid idea, as you said earlier, like have it, trying to like put your finger on one tiny little piece of that massive complex puzzle is just never going to work. Which leads to the third thing, which is that if you want to have any impact on biology, you've got to take a multi-targeted approach. So you've got to look what the best combinations of targets are within all of that complexity and understand how you can target them and also what molecules actually already have that footprint to stick to that sort of combination of targets or alternatively use a, a combination of different molecules that are going to have the action that you want in the body. And with this approach, it improves the efficacy of drug development massively. Like the hit rate hugely improves because instead of ignoring the complexity and ignoring the fact that drugs stick to multiple things, you actually use it to your advantage. Um, and it's just a much more sophisticated way of, of molecular discovery. It, if I had known what you know 20 years ago when I first started 
working on using supplements to fix the 300 pound uh, um, problem that I had and all the other mitochondrial issues and autoimmune and whatever. The first two, three years, I would say, I'm going to test this one vitamin, right? And so I'll test it for a month. Well, it didn't get a result. Then I'll test another vitamin for a month. And I just sat down one day and I said, you know, there's more vitamins than I have months left in my life, right? So, and then I was like, well, wait, where, why do I believe that only one is going to work? It, it doesn't even make sense on its face. So maybe I'll do everything that might work all at the same time, as long as there's no evidence that's going to fight with itself. And if I get the result I wanted, hooray. And then I can start taking them out at least. But that algorithm for biohacking has served me really well. And it seems like sort of the homebrew version of systems pharmacology. So like, let's hit all the pathways. <laughs> at least it's results driven. Okay, so you decided to apply systems pharmacology from Big Pharma at Nuchito, but you could have gone after a bunch of stuff. And you partnered with some really well-known guys, a biogerontologist named Tom Kirkwood and Thomas von Zlinke. I can never say his name right. Um, but this is a, a molecular biologist um, who was the first to discover oxidative stress and DNA damage, like kind of you know very big names in biogerontology, which is a small field, but still. Um, why did you go after aging? You could have gone after many other medical things. Well, actually, we were approached by by quite a prominent figure in the, the world of aging research and who said, so Aubrey de Grey. Yeah, he's a friend. I love Aubrey. He's been on the show a couple of times. He has the best beard ever, right? He certainly does. Yeah. So, so Aubrey actually approached us and said, do you know what? The way that you do drug discovery is really forward thinking. And I really agree with the way you do in it. And have you ever thought of looking at aging? Because aging is perhaps one of the most biologically complex things we know. And we know for a fact there is no way conventional discovery is going to go come anywhere near to finding anything with the way they do it. So how about using the systems pharmacology approach to look at you know aging as a whole? Because aging is just a huge mashup of all sorts of different things that are going on. Are you going to cut your head off and freeze it like Aubrey? <laughs> I, I, um, I don't, I don't know, actually. I've had some very interesting conversations with people about cutting their heads off and transporting it to Russia and things like that. But <laughs> I, I have too. Uh, I, I'm not signed up for it. I, um, I, in fact, Aubrey and I had a really passionate discussion in the back of a car one time about that. He's like, but you have to, it's a backup plan. And, and it's, I'm like, yeah, but I, I don't know. <laughs> so I'll have to do an episode on that again. Uh, maybe I'll get Max Marmer on here or something, but, uh, it's, it, I always ask figures in anti-aging. Okay. Do you have a backup plan? Um, and since I don't have a backup plan other than maybe probably reincarnation. So there you go. There's a backup plan. That's less work if it's real. But um, of all the things you could have done, so Aubrey influenced you as he's influenced a lot of people, including me. And But you look at aging. I mean, there's hormones. There's all kinds of pathways. And you ended up on NAD, but with a different perspective than a lot of people. And, and for new listeners, NAD is uh, a compound I've written about extensively in my anti-aging book called Superhuman, it's something I've done intravenously. I take all sorts of precursors. I do all kinds of stuff. And I learned some really neat stuff uh, the first time that Nicola and I uh, sat down. She walked me through some cool pathways that are, she's going to share with you guys today. Uh, but I, I think it's a fundamental molecule. But I wonder, how did you get to that one when you could have done like, you know, 50,000 different other molecules? Yeah. So we literally had probably 50,000 different ideas on the list of things that we, we could be doing. Um, but but in all honesty, um, there was there was two reasons. The first was that you know, our, our idea was we wanted to get some cutting edge science out to people really quickly so they could benefit from it. NAD had the benefit where people had already started to hear, hearing about it and accepting that it was, a, a you know, an important thing as opposed to some of the other um, things that we were working on, like epigenetic reprogramming that was a bit too far out there for the general public at the time. Um, however, um, NAD, we, we felt was just on the edge of people starting to understand maybe that it, what it was and that it was something beneficial to do with aging. So that's why we started looking at that initially. And also because NAD is actually a really, really good example of something that is biologically very complex and something that is actually well suited to a systems pharmacology approach. 
uh, rather than a, a single target approach. I just put a question through to the Upgrade Collective, who's our live audience today. I'm asking how many of them are taking NAD or precursors. So I'll probably get a few answers in a minute here. Can you talk about what NAD does in the body? Because I think a lot of listeners probably didn't catch one of my earlier episodes about that. So walk me through why it's a fundamental aging molecule. Yeah, so NAD, it's it's a natural molecule, first of all. It's found in everywhere in your body, every single cell. And it is, it's so important that if you didn't have it in your cells, you would literally die in 30 seconds. Um, and one of the main reasons is that it's involved in your energy production. So it literally helps convert the food that you eat into the energy that your cells need to stay alive. So into ATP, the sort of cellular energy currency. And the way it does this is it acts as an electron carrier. So some people that are familiar with NAD might sometimes see it called NAD with a little plus next to it, or they might see it called NADH. And what this means is that NAD can flip between two states. NAD plus is its oxidized form, and that's when it is ready to accept electrons. So it's a bit like an empty bus picking up passengers. Uh, the other side, NADH, that's its reduced form, and that's when it's already full of electrons and it's ready to drop them off um, at another molecule. And it's this movement of electrons back and forwards that allows energy to be generated in the mitochondria. So NAD is absolutely fundamental to energy production in the mitochondria by all the pathways that produce energy. So that is why you would be dead in 30 seconds if you didn't have NAD in your body. It'd be like having a house without wiring to carry the electricity around. Nothing would work, right? Yeah, absolutely. It is absolutely critical. And that's the, the most well-known function of NAD. However, it's become a lot more apparent recently that it's not just energy production that NAD is involved with. It's actually involved also in cellular maintenance and repair. So NAD almost acts like a, um, well, it acts as a substrate for a lot of different repair pathways. So when I say a substrate, it's almost like the fuel which switches on different enzymes and, and different processes. And a key example is DNA repair. So DNA damage is, is, a, is you know, one of the major causes of aging. And every day the UV light's damaging our DNA. We've got our own oxidative stress from our metabolism damaging our DNA, all sorts. And our body has to continually repair it. And it has DNA repair enzymes that do this. And NAD is critical in actually driving this DNA repair and making sure the DNA repair enzymes get to the, the damage site and actually do the job that is required. So that's an example of it being used as a substrate. That makes sense. Uh, and I've seen studies, in fact, I reference them in my book, between age zero and age 90, there's a 90% decline in NAD levels. So when I'm looking at biohacking and living to at least 180, like I'm pretty sure I want the levels of compounds that are found in a 25 or 30 year old to be in my body when I'm 125. Generally a good way of looking at aging. Yeah, it's actually quite scary, you know, how much NAD declines in all of the studies that they've, they've shown in brain and skin and different tissues. The decline is really exponential. Um, and that's not good when you know the important things that it does, and especially when it comes to aging. So one of the, the, re the key things that NAD is known as is an activator of something called the sirtuins, and the sirtuins are also known as the longevity proteins. And what they do is they um, switch on and off lots of different genes and pathways that are associated with cellular health and, um, and, and basically good aging. And NAD is critical for those sirtuin proteins to work. So again, your NAD is dropping, um, your energy is mis malfunctioning, you're getting mitochondrial dysfunction, which means that you don't physically have as much energy, but that mitochondrial dysfunction also gives off oxidative stress, which then goes around the rest of the cell and starts damaging all sorts of things there. And then what you'd really want is your, your DNA repair and your sirtuins to step up and start repairing all the damage, but they can't because they need NAD as well. So it's so critical to cellular function. Uh, so you decided to go after that. And David Sinclair is a friend who's been on uh, the show a couple of times talking about uh, some of the precursors. I take pretty much all the precursors. I've done a couple of different episodes about them. And at Upgrade Labs, I've had 
oh, at least 10 IV infusions of it. Actually, I've, been, I've probably had closer to 30 over my life. Uh, and an IV infusion of NAD is expensive. It's actually used for drug and alcohol uh, recovery. People do about 10 of those infusions and they just don't want alcohol anymore because they feel better, which is pretty strange. But from an aging perspective, man, my sleep improved so dramatically when I did it. So getting those levels you know, back up to youthful has been a, a really big deal for me. But most people are not going to sit through you know, 20 hours of feeling like there's something sitting on your chest and uh, with a needle in your arm unless you're a pretty dedicated biohacker. Um, what did you figure out when you looked at systems pharmacology and NAD? Uh, I, I know because we got to talk about it in person the last time I was in London before all this pandemic stuff. Um, but, but like, what, what did you figure out about it? So I think a key thing for people to understand is to go back to why NAD actually declines. And to understand that, you really need to understand actually why, like how NAD is produced by the cells when they're young. And because NAD is so critical, the cells are actually really good at making NAD. So your, your body is really good at producing it. And the way it does this is it takes precursors, which you've mentioned, which are usually vitamin B3 derivatives. And these are like the raw materials that the cell needs to make NAD. And it ships them into the cell. And once they're in the cell, there's multiple different pathways and multiple different enzymes that actually convert these precursor raw materials into NAD. So then you've got this lovely NAD in the cell, and then the NAD is actually used up. So the sirtuins are using it up, the DNA repair enzymes are using it up. And when they use NAD, they actually break it back down into a precursor. And the precursor that they break it back down into is nicotinamide. And then this is where it gets really interesting. And this is what most people don't actually realize, is that the cell actually has a really good ability to recycle that precursor straight back into useful NAD again. And this pathway is called the salvage pathway. So, so we use NAD, it becomes nicotinamide, and then we recycle it back into NAD. Exactly that, yeah. And in, in youth, that is the main way that our cells make NAD. They're continually recycling it. It's pretty cool. Our bodies are so lazy. Anything that's hard to make, we recycle. It, it's like the ultimate efficiency machine. Same thing with ATP that a lot of people have heard of in the mitochondria, right? We take ATP and it goes to ADP, which it goes from try to die. And they're like, oh, let's just put another phosphorus on there. Let's just reuse that molecule forever. Uh, and if you're good at that, magically you make more electrons. But then if you don't have NAD, even if you make electrons, you can't move them around. So you have to have both of those things at high levels and both of them salvaging themselves or recycling themselves efficiently. And those are hallmarks of youth. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So that, that is the major way that our cells provide themselves with NAD. Um, and I guess, you know, the recycling thing makes sense because it is so important that the body wants to have this kind of, well, fail safe, you can't really say that, but way of actually making sure that it's continuously got this NAD available to do all of this repair and all of this energy metabolism and things that it's actually needed for. But the problem is, is that as we get older, there is a fundamental failing in that system in that it's now known that the main rate limit enzyme, so like the pinch point in the salvage pathway, this enzyme called NAMPT actually declines as you get older. And what this means is that as your body's using up NAD and breaking it back down into the precursor, this precursor then can't actually be recycled back into NAD again. So what happens is it starts to pile up in the cell and cells generally don't like anything building up. So then the cell has to find a way to get rid of it. So what it does is it starts up regulating other pathways, namely a methylation pathway. Um, and this upregulates an enzyme called NNMT. And that enzyme actually starts trying to methylate nicotinamide and excrete it out the cell to get rid of it because it's not getting recycled. So your recycling doesn't work. So your, your pile of aluminum cans builds up, you know, your recycling pile inside a cell, which is nicotinamide, right? And the body can't get rid of that via normal things. So it says, all right, we've got to start getting rid of it via, say, the normal trash can, right? So it's, it's trying to pull stuff off that pile because it can't melt it down into new aluminum, if I'm making a kind of a rough analogy there. Exactly that. And that's problematic because you can see straight away how this whole systems approach comes into play because 
one thing stopped working. That's had an impact on the nicotinamide building up or the cans. And then the cell has to get rid of it. And then that's meant another enzymatic pathway has been thrown out of its usual, um, you know, balance. And then you start methylating this nicotinamide to get rid of it. And what this means is that you're actually using methyl groups that are used for other things in the body, like epigenetics and things like that. And then they're not available for that job. So you can soon see how it all starts escalating. It's funny when you're getting an, an IV NAD infusion, which I'm still a huge fan of, you get really flushed and red and sometimes you get some, some nausea, kind of like a, a niacin flush. Um, but if you take a methyl donor before you do it, uh, then magically you have almost none of those side effects, uh, which, is, which is a really neat thing. So a lot of the more advanced practitioners, and that's the sort of stuff that we would do at Upgrade Labs as well, um, you can take some a betaine uh, ahead of time, and then magically it's a methyl donor, and then and that's probably why, right? Because you have you have enough methyl groups to handle any excess nicotinamide. Is that a, a likely explanation? That is exactly it. But what it also shows is it also shows that probably your salvage pathway isn't functioning efficiently because if. So the classic case with IVs, put the NAD into the cell. If you actually had a really well-functioning salvage pathway, then rather than that NAD getting used once and then getting chucked straight back out, that expensive NAD, it could actually get recycled round and round. So actually improving that would be good. So, so what you're doing with Nuchito basically is you're saying, why don't we fix the recycling pathway so that you can use it? And with an NAD infusion, like, hey, why don't we just give you a lot more new aluminum cans? But then you're like, you're going to get a bigger pile in the cells and you're going to have to clear that out. So one of the ways around that is, okay, take more methyl donors so that you can at least clear out the extra nicotinamide. Um, okay, is that the, but the, the bad recycling pathway is one of the ways we lose NAD, but there's another major way we lose NAD. And then I want to talk about how to fix the recycling pathway. So we've got some inflammation that sucks NAD out. Walk me through that. Yeah. So as well as being, you know, not as good at recycling NAD, there's also things that are wasting NAD in the cell. And this is hugely linked to inflammation. So it's been found that one of the major causes of NAD loss in the cell is via a, a protein called CD38. Um, and what CD38 does is it's basically involved in immune activation. And in order for it to activate immune cells, it has to use a huge amount of NAD as its substrate to make the enzyme go, basically. So for every one molecule of its downstream substrate that it makes, it requires 100 molecules of NAD. So you can see that if you get upregulation of CD38 and you get 100 molecules every time with each molecule of CD38 being used, this is going to put a massive dent in your NAD levels. And for a while, it wasn't really understood, like, why, why is this affecting NAD and why is it upregulated? But recently, it's been found that the reason that CD38 is increasing is actually linked to another area or another hallmark of aging, which is cellular senescence. So senescent cells, they secrete a lot of inflammatory factors. And these inflammatory factors increase your CD38 expression and then your CD38 goes crazy and chews up all your NAD, basically. Mm. So the higher the CD38, the lower the NAD. Exactly that, because it is just using it up constantly. So, so we've got people who are aging, and they can't recycle NAD well, so their levels go down. And they've got more senescent cells, which they haven't removed via all the intermittent fasting <laughs> things that I've been talking about, or even some of the pharmaceuticals uh, like rapamycin. Uh, that you might want to end up using. And so they're basically chewing up more and recycling less at the same time, which is why we get that 90% decline as we age. Yeah, exactly that. So right at a time when your cells really, really could do with some recycling going on, it doesn't happen. So you've got all of these different factors at play. You've got lack of recycling, you've got CD38 using up huge amounts of NAD. You've got the DNA repair enzymes trying to cope with the fact there's loads of damage in the cell because your mitochondria aren't functioning sufficiently and they're using NAD. And then it's pretty clear that this is this, there's a whole range of things going on that's contributing to this dramatic decline in NAD. So 
it, it kind of shows that, you know, simply something like a precursor is probably not going to fix all of this because you're not addressing the root causes. Now, it's a little bit off topic, but do you take any CD38 blockers? I do via Nichido Time Plus because we have that in there. Oh, there's, I didn't realize you put one in there. Okay, cool. So yeah. I know you put like, like there's all these different pathways that you can elegantly manage. And the way you think when we sat down in London there, I was like, wow, okay, you've got it. So it's not just one thing, it's many things. And this idea of, of stacking things so that you get the results you want, knowing that one compound probably won't do everything you want is, is nice. If I turn to my camera over there, you'd see this whole table covered with bottles of supplements because I've been doing that for myself for 20 years saying I want this and I want this and I want this. But putting it together via things that, that frankly, some of the research I probably haven't done, but because you have the systems pharmacology background and you're saying I'm going to solve this one problem via everything that affects this complex while well, you're, you're wasting it over here, you're not recycling it over here uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, so, all right. Now we, we understand the two big ways we're, we're losing it. Are there other ways we lose NAD? Yeah, so the, the main ones are the, the, the actual increased use of NAD. So obviously, like you don't want to be inhibiting DNA repair because you want that to still keep happening. But ultimately, as the cells get older and they've got more damage through all these other things going on, you're going to get more DNA damage you need more repair, they're going to be using more NAD, which means that there's less NAD that's available to activate the sirtuins um, and other beneficial things like that. So there's there's lots of different factors at play there, but they're the main ones. Okay, those are, those are the main reasons. I'm interested in having a better recycling pathway for uh, NAD, uh, and I know that you have uh, built Time Plus to do that and a bunch of other things, which is the the primary Nuchito, uh, I think, groundbreaking uh, NAD, I'm going to call it a, an NAD systems management supplement. I, I don't know the right name. What, what do you call it? Just an NAD booster. <laughs> the NAD booster. That, that sounds kind of boring because it, it's one thing. You can boost NAD, like say, you can pour more NAD in the system, which is what I've been doing. But this idea of increasing the efficiency of reuse seems just more elegant from a, a biohacking perspective. I mean, when we talk about it, we say it's like a whole systems approach to NAD restoration. And what studies do you have that says this works? So when, you know, when we first started off looking at NAD, our whole mission was to really look at let's look at all the science and really work out what's going on. Let's not ignore it. And let's come up with a formulation that addresses all these underlying problems, these root causes of cellular NAD decline. So one of the first experiments that we did was we said, right, first thing, let's just fix the cell. Let's just restore its youthful ability to make and recycle its own NAD. So we're not trying to you know, change anything other than what it would naturally be doing when it's younger. And we put together a formulation that didn't contain any precursors. So we're not putting any more raw material into the cell. We're just trying to fix it. And what we found was that we could actually boost NAD, and this is in cells and human, and show that it was boosting NAD without a precursor. So this was just by actually fixing the underlying root causes that were causing NAD decline. So for us, that was like proof of principle. But how big of a boost are we talking about? So initially, that was around a 90% increase above baseline. So, you know, that's that's not bad at all um, because we weren't putting anything into the system. This was just fixing the system. This was just making your cells have their youthful recycling capacity and their youthful ability. So, so you fixed it, the NAMPT pathway, the recycling pathway. You fixed that and magically the body, oh, let me turn on my recycling plant. And then you got more recycling stuff. So the levels went up. Yeah. Okay. So looking at that, looking at inhibiting CD38, all of the things that were previously discussed and that actually increased NAD without putting any further raw material into the system. So then the next obvious thing was, okay, so what happens if we now improve the cell and we also put in some raw material? So let's put a precursor in there and actually see what happens then. And in our pilot study, we found that in our human volunteers, with two human volunteers in the study, that on average, we were able to increase NAD by 242% over two weeks supplementation with the formulation that became Nichido Time Plus. 
Wow. So 242% is a, a pretty meaningful boost. How does it compare to just taking precursors? So on average, the, the, the data varies between about 40% to about 90% um, for, for the precursors. Often that's usually higher dosage than what it says you should be taking to achieve that. Um, but that's, yeah. So it, for us, we, we were excited that it actually demonstrated that, you know, this approach of fixing the cell, which was, which was a really different approach based on the latest science that showed the reasons why NAD was declining, um, actually had a real meaningful impact. And actually, we're, we're currently, as, as well as that pilot study, we're currently running um, another clinical trial at the moment. So, um, you know, in true drug style, <laughs> um, it's a double-blinded placebo-controlled crossover study with our supplement, uh, where we're looking at, you know, measuring obviously NAD levels, but then also what downstream effects does that higher NAD have in these people? So we're looking at improved mitochondrial function. We're looking at what it's doing to oxidative stress. We're looking at activation of the sirtuins, things like that, because original data from our pilot study demonstrated that we, we were upregulating the salvage pathway. We seen increased expression of NAMPT. We found that we were getting increased expression of the sirtuins. So now we're just really digging into that much deeper with a larger group of people um, age between 20 and 80, and also both male and female, which is a thing that doesn't normally happen in many <laughs> clinical trials, unfortunately. I, I thought we were supposed to only do studies on young white men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what they used to do because that was all they had in college, you know, 50 years ago, and those were always the guinea pigs. So I'm really happy you're mixing men and women. It's important. I'm also happy that you're testing it in older subjects versus younger ones. What are you seeing with regards to NAD levels like in 20 or 25-year-olds today? Is there a trend? Are there benefits when they boost it versus someone who's 40 versus someone who's 80? So we don't have the results from that study. It was delayed due to COVID. Um, so I can't say exactly what's happened in that. But in general, what we find is anecdotal evidence from our customers is that we definitely seem to get a huge improvement in older people, like reporting more benefits. Um, and also if they're, if they're younger, it's generally people that are maybe less fit um, and also or have some sort of like medical issue that they're very conscious of and that they, they use that as like a, a gauge of like, oh, I actually feel better today. Well, 48% of people under 40 have early onset mitochondrial dysfunction, according to the research in Superhuman. So there's a big thing there. And frankly, keeping your levels high is a lot easier than letting them drop, uh, getting diseases of aging and then raising them. <laughs> so like if you can prevent it, you should start anti-aging in your 20s because it's actually not called anti-aging. It's called performance enhancement. Like, oh, look, I have more energy than all my friends. That's amazing. Uh, and then suddenly, oh, I didn't age like all my friends. And it, you know, there's future benefits, but there's current benefits. So for things like athletes, have you seen any differences from boosting an AD? Yeah. So we've had, again, anecdotal evidence. We haven't done any clinical trials on it, but we definitely have people report an improved performance, um, which, you know, in terms of what NAD is known to do within the body, in terms of increased energy production, better mitochondrial function, it's not unsurprising. Um, also in terms of recovery, there's studies to show that NAD actually increases the number of um, stem cells in the muscle, which aids regeneration um, after any exercise. So that's perhaps not unsurprising. But the thing that actually, when you talk about young people, that springs to mind for me is quite a lot of customers will say, do you know what? I didn't realize how bad I felt till I didn't feel it anymore. Um, so I think it's people don't realize how sort of what their energy is actually really pretty bad and the brain fog's pretty bad. And then all of a sudden when it's gone, they're like, wow, like, I feel like, you know, I can breathe again. I've been living under a cloud. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I've seen some really interesting data about long COVID and a decline in NAD. Have you come across any of that writing or any of that research? Uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, I've been obviously following that. Um, so, so what the research shows is that basically when, when cells have been infected with COVID, that there's a huge plummet in NAD levels. So just put that into perspective of the types of people that are having a worse time with COVID or people that are older. 
and people that have got metabolic diseases, both two, two things that are known to have people that are known to have low NAD to begin with. So if COVID virus is actually decreasing NAD in the cells and in these people, they're at a worse starting point. They've got a handicap already by having lower NAD. So you can kind of see how it might be more difficult for them to actually recover from it. The other thing is that's really interesting is that when COVID is infecting cells, the response by the cell is to massively upregulate all the genes that are involved in NAD production. And one of them is NAMPT, which is the salvage pathway. <laughs> but you don't have the raw materials to turn on the salvage pathway in that case, most likely. So then you, your body upregulates the genes, but it can't actually run the salvage pathway because it doesn't have... What, what does it need to run the salvage pathway? In nicotinamides. Which, what is it, nicotinamide? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, is it NR or in NMN that it needs to do that? So the salvage pathway, um, it can recycle multiple different vitamin B3 precursors. But the main, the main thing is that it's, it's kind of utilizing what is already in the cell. So you, you obviously do have NAD in the cell to begin with, and it's just turning on that efficiency of being able to keep that flow going round and round rather than use it once and shoot it down the recycling pathway, uh, sorry, the, the garbage pathway. So with Time Plus, you're not using just precursors because you're getting, um, what, from 90% to 240-something percent, you're getting many more results by stacking things in the right amount. What are, like, what else is in there that's different? So if you, if you go back and look at the, the root causes of NAD decline, so the, the main one that we've really focused on talking about is restoring the salvage pathway. So we have compounds in there that are designed to do that. So one of the main ones is Sephora Johonica, uh, which is a, a dried flower, and that has really good levels of quercetin, rutin, and chocrutin. And they're all really powerful flavonoids that are known to activate NAMPT. And again, this goes with our data that we can see in the blood cells of people that have actually been taken time plus, we see an upregulation of this NAMPT enzyme. And the important part is that's the rate limit and enzyme in the salvage pathway. So that's the one that you absolutely have to fix because if you, the lower your levels of NAMPT, the lower your recycling and vice versa. So that is in there, those compounds to actually boost NAMPT levels. The other thing that we've got in there to promote recycling is EGCG. So this is a extract, uh, sorry, an active molecule that's found in green tea. And what this has been found to do is actually inhibit the enzyme that promotes the methylation and excretion of nicotinamide. So if you actually have an older cell where the salvage pathway is decreased and it's had to upregulate NNMT to try and get rid of it and methylate it. Um, and then you do restore the efficiency of the salvage pathway. You also want to make sure that waste route's getting shut down as well, just because it's overexpressed in the cells. It's methylating the nicotinamide, it's excreting it rather than recycling it back into fresh NAD. So we have that compound in there to actually inhibit the methylation and promote the recycling. And obviously that has other positive effects because it prevents methyl donor depletion, which as you mentioned, can make you feel pretty rubbish. So yeah, so there are two main things to promote this recycling of NAD. And then other compounds that we've got are more to prevent the wastage. So when we're talking before about what, what you use to inhibit CD38, because CD38 is a, is a major um, consumer of NAD. And for that, we use apigenin. So apigenin is known to um, be a really good inhibitor of CD38. It's known by itself to boost NAD levels by up to 50% in cells. And we use that in its natural form in parsley because parsley is one of the highest natural um, co compounds that's naturally got a high level of apigenin in. So that's why we, we use that in our, in our formulation there. And how did you figure out the right amount of each one of these to include? Lots of different experiments. <laughs> okay, so th there's ratios that matter. There's huge, yeah. So, so my back, my PhD was all on bioavailability, and you know, looking at how much of things you need to take to be able to actually have the right molar concentration in the cell by the time that you've accounted for loss in the stomach, loss through the gut, loss, you know, breakdown, all sorts of things like that. So, I'm really passionate 
when we were developing this to make sure that we had the optimal amounts and ratios of the different compounds to actually have a, a real impact within the body. Is there a risk if, say, someone's taking, you know, fistfuls of quercetin because they read online that it's good for you? Like, are you going to go over and turn things off? So I think there's always there's always a balance because, as we've mentioned, you know, cells don't like things piling up. So generally, your homeostatic mechanisms will start kicking in, and um, you know, changing other pathways to try and accommodate whatever they don't like. So I think there is a risk of, you know, you could possibly, you know, take too much of, of a supplement. There's always a fine, a fine balance there. As you might expect, I'm practicing intermittent fasting right now. You know, the whole, just wrote a book on intermittent fasting. I've been doing it for 10 years. What is the best time to take uh, the Nuchito Time Plus? So I want to boost my NAD. Do I want to do it at the beginning of a fast, in the middle of a fast, at the end of a fast? Talk, just talk to me about NAD and fasting in general. Yeah. So, so fasting, you know, some of the beneficial effects of fasting come from increasing NAD. And the way this works is that NAD is really sensitive to any energy stressors. So if there's an energy stress, such as fasting, where you've kind of got a lack of fuel coming into the body, it basically um, turns up NAD production. And what having high NAD does is it makes sure that the cell is, is kind of saying, well, we've got this period of stress, we've got to survive the stress, so let's make sure our energy is efficient, let's make sure we're recycling and repairing things, uh, because we don't know when the next fuel is going to come. And it basically really makes the cell go on a, you know, a, a mode that is actually repair, protect, and survive. And the way that the kind of link between fasting and NAD is something called AMPK. So this is an energy sensor in the cell. And when you have fasting, you have the energy stress, AMPK, AMPK kicks in. And the way that AMPK increases NAD is, guess what? It upregulates the salvage pathway. It actually increases the levels of NAMPT. So again, that just shows how important that pathway is in the cells for NAD production. The other way that fasting actually boosts NAD is it also, you know, you flip from burning carbohydrates to fats, and this affects the ratio of um, NAD to NADH. So remember I said NAD exists in two forms, um, NAD plus, NADH. Well, actually, the ratio of, of those two molecules is also really important for the cell. And when you're young, you have a higher ratio of NAD plus to NADH. But as you get older, it starts to slip. Um, and the, the ratio between the two, between NAD plus and NDH, declines. And fasting actually pushes that back in a favorable direction because it starts converting NADH to NAD plus. So that's also a really beneficial thing to be having done in your cells by fasting. So then the best time to take time plus middle of a fast or just the morning of an intermittent fast? I, I'm so still not clear on that. We actually say take it when you break in a fast. So you take actually. it at the end of the fast. Okay. Yeah. And the reason for that is because there are several compounds in there that actually also boost AMPK. So one of them is quercetin. And also one of the other ingredients that I didn't talk about before is something called alpha lipoic acid. So that is an AMPK activator. So if you take Nishido Time Plus at the end of the fast, right at the time when usually AMPK would be getting turned down and your NAD levels would be starting to get turned down, actually by having these ingredients and these actives in that are promoting AMPK, you actually extend the benefits of the fast because you're keeping those beneficial pathways actually activated. There's one other AMPK activator that deserves mention here. Can you guess what it is? Metformin? Oh, no, that, come on, don't be too nerdy. Coffee! Coffee! <laughs> Caffeine has a huge effect on AMPK as well, but you can do that in the middle of a fast, and it seems to be, not just seems to be, there's studies that show it's beneficial. Um, in fact, yeah, there's all sorts of, of things that happen. So the AMPK effect seems like you want it during a fast, not at the end. Y you could have it both to be quite honest, because obviously by fasting, you're, you're, you're naturally activating AMPK itself. So this is more a way of like, when I'm stopping the influence from fasting, how can I keep the benefits going by a, another mechanism? 
that will allow AMPK to be kept high whilst I've started eating again. So it's boosted during the fast and then you take this at the end of the fast to keep it high. Yeah, exactly that. That makes sense. All right. That's exciting. There was one other thing that we talked about uh, when I met you in person in London a couple of years ago now. Jeez, it's been a while. Um, you talked about how you thought, and I don't think that that you had your full formulation dialed in at the time. You were still thinking about it. And you were saying, well, if we do the systems approach we're talking about with Nuchito during an IV NAD application, that it would probably work better. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah. So, so again, going back to the, the root causes of NAD decline. So how, how is having an IV NAD influence in that? So you are taking pure NAD and it's ready-made form. So not even the precursors, you're putting it in the cell. And what happens is in a young cell, you put the NAD in, it gets used by the sirtuins, it gets used by the DNA repair enzymes, it gets broken down into nicotinamide, and then it would get recycled. However, in older cells, that salvage pathway isn't working. So you're paying for a very expensive NAD infusion. You're putting this lovely shiny NAD into the cell. It's getting used. It's getting that sort of first pass. And then it gets broken down into nicotinamide. But then where does it go? It can't get recycled because your salvage pathway is inefficient. Therefore, it has to get methylated. You have to take trimethylglycine or betaine or whatever to actually counteract those horrible effects. And this expensive NAD is effectively getting excreted straight out the cell. However, if you have a well-functioning salvage pathway before you have your IV infusion, then that NAD is not going to be used once. It's going to continually get recycled and be used over and over again. So you're actually going to get a prolonged benefit from the IV infusion. But just by making sure that your cells um, have that youthful recycling capacity beforehand. And also you don't want to be chucking new NAD into a cell if CD38 is there and it's just going to be eating it all up. So it's all about fixing those root causes, those multiple root causes before the IV NAD so you get the benefits. It, it makes a lot of sense. One thing that I noticed is that when I'm taking you know, lots of the stuff that I take, um, I could usually do a gram of IV NAD in 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, and people who have done NAD right now, their eyes just got big because usually doing a gram is like a three hour intense thing. You know, that one hour is pretty intense. I'm sort of, you know, spacey and not, not that comfortable, but I'm like, let's just get it done. Um, but I'm guessing my salvage pathways probably work better than the average, uh, than average just because I take a lot of stuff. Um, so You've explained that, and I found, though, if I took the methyl donor, because clearly my, my recycling pathways aren't working that well because I'm still getting some effects, I take the methyl donor, I've got to do that as well. Okay, so I've learned a lot about some of the NAD interactions that actually went beyond uh, the science I had available when I wrote Superhuman about three years ago. So that's that's intriguing. And your supplement's called Time Plus from Nuchito, and Guys, you know, I always ask guests who have cool stuff uh, to offer a discount because, hey, you just listened to the show. And so we got to take care of our community, including our listeners and including our Upgrade Collective. If you guys don't know about the Upgrade Collective, that's ouropgradecollective.com. We've got the live audience there. And you can use code DAVE10 at nuchido.com, N-U-C-H-I-D-O, to get this new form of NAD booster that is a systems-based approach. And I think it's actually really well-scienced, as you could tell by this interview. Would you like to take a few live questions from the Upgrade Collective members? I know they're all pretty excited about this interview. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. All right. Let's patch somebody in. All right. Who wants to go first? Do the hand raise thing if you want to, or you can just type your question in and then I'll call you. You're all staring at me. This is why it's really cool. We can actually just edit out big blanks of silence. See, <laughs> Sarah is thinking about asking a question right now for sure. I can see her. She's like got this look on her face. Robin wants one. Robin's been typing questions all the time. You want to ask a question, Robin? I missed the beginning of your talk, so I might have missed you addressing that, but I'm curious about the transience of your NAD levels that you test. Okay. So, so the first question, uh, the black pepper, that, so that's in there for the active molecule called piperine. 
which is known to increase the absorption of multiple different active ingredients in the gut. And given my background in bioavailability, I'm also really keen to avoid, you know, I'm really keen to avoid supplements that just go in your mouth and out the other end without being absorbed. So that is the reason that it's in there. Um, and the other question was the NAD patches. So, you know, in a way, NAD patches can be looked at as a similar a similar thing to infusions. They're taking the, 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 the full NAD molecule and putting it into the cell. So you've still got the issue in that if you don't have an efficient salvage pathway that can actually utilize that NAD and recycle it, then you, you're not going to get the full benefit and the NAD is very quickly going to get broken down, turned into nicotinamide and excreted from the cell. So it's it's kind of like, it doesn't matter which way, you can't ignore the complex problems that are causing NAD to decline. It's really important to factor those in. One warning, if you are on any medications and you take something with bioprene, it lets everything in the gut, whether it's a medication or even some other proteins through. So you have to be uh, more careful about the other things you take uh, with bioprene containing supplements. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not certain that you, that, that you're going to find everybody wants bioprene because of that concern about what else is coming in. Do you ever think about that? Like holes in the gut lining kind of a thing? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's always a fine balance of like the pro weighing up the pros and cons of, of the, you know, the different things it's absorption versus like you say, absorption of different drugs and everything. And also everyone's an individual. So everyone reacts completely different to all sorts of different supplements in terms of their, their bioavailability and their reactions to them. So it, it's kind of like, it's very difficult to, to be able to, to suit everyone's needs. It, it definitely is. Any other questions from the upgrade collective? Tina's got a question. All right, Tina, what do you, what do you have? Thank you for letting me come on and ask this question. Great interview and great information. Thank you so much. Um, my question is this. You alluded to this early in the talk, but I didn't quite catch the implication of taking high levels of vitamin B, like B12, and how this interacts with the supplement or the NAD and the pathways. And if you could explain that a little bit more, because I do take B12 shots. So I'm wondering how that interacts. Okay, so the important thing is um, with the B vitamins, the one that's really important for NAD is vitamin, vitamin, vitamin B3. So actually that's completely different than vitamin B12. So it's, they're involved in different pathways and different processes. So actually there is, there is no overlap there. But one thing just to mention is that some people can't take um, B vitamins on an empty stomach because it can make you feel a bit queasy. So that's just something to bear in mind if you're taking multiple B vitamins at the same time. I call those the the barfy four. There's four supplements you can take during a fast that'll make you throw up and B complex is one of them. <laughs> so that's from the last book. <laughs> so you would not take B complex with your supplement or you would just be careful about it? Uh, we would advise that you don't take any of the same or similar ingredients. So any of the other vitamin B3 derivatives at the same time, just to avoid you going over your, your daily dose limit for vitamin B3, because we've already got nicotinamide in there at a high, high dose. Okay. Thank you. I think we had a question from Richard as well. Thank you, Dave. Uh, excellent interview. Thank you so much. If you are not fasting, what is the ideal time to take Time Plus? So we recommend taking, it, it's two, two doses. So we recommend taking your first dose in the morning. So when you first have some food and then your second dose around six hours later, um, because what you find is that um, NAD is actually, it's, well, it's linked to your circadian rhythm. And if you look at the way NAD fluctuates throughout the day, it kind of rises and falls and rises and falls. So we, we say take it as two doses, split apart by around six hours um, to kind of mirror this effect. What's your take on niacin, um, the kind that makes you flush versus niacinamide? 
Um, so I think, so, so basically niacin and niacinamide are, are structurally very, very similar. Um, they've just got a tiny little difference, which makes one do the flushing effect. The niacin and the nic- nicotinamide doesn't have the flushing effect. And, um, but they're, they're both equally as good precursors, you know, in the body to actually get converted into NAD. I know a lot of people use them because they're quite, they quite light the flush and feel like, you know, it's, it's actually flushing out the body and some people do use it for that purpose. It, it's good with a sauna. You know, if you wanted yeah, to get more, more circulation under the skin, that would work. Yeah, it certainly does that. <laughs> um, some of the others, in fact, there's a whole chat thread from the upgrade collective saying, how do we measure our NAD levels? Like, how would I know if I was low? I mean, there's symptoms or just look at the calendar. They'll tell you if you're low. But if a, a consumer wanted to order this, an NAD test or go to a doctor and ask for it, can you do that? No. So unfortunately, NAD is a really tricky thing to measure. And that's because its structure means that it can degrade quite easily. So the, the way it can flip between different forms, it means it's, it's, it's just very, very unstable. So often if you want to get some blood done and then get it sent away and analyzed in the lab, by the time it gets to the lab, the NAD will be completely broken down and there'll be nothing left to measure. So when we measure NAD in a clinical trial, we literally take the blood straight out of the person's arm. It goes straight in a tube on ice and then immediately processed where we extract the cells, separate everything out and really preserve the NAD. And um, then the way that you actually measure NAD is quite an expensive way. I use something called mass spec and it's, it's not that cheap um, to do. So there have been some consumer kits pop up saying that they can measure NAD um, I would be very careful about interpretation of any results that, that come back from them because I've yet to find any way that they can be done reliably by spotting some blood on a paper. So I, I could translate that from scientists speak to, you think those tests are full of crap? Did, did I get that right? I would, I would like to <laughs> test them and compare them <laughs> to our data that we have for known, known concentrations of NAD and I would be very surprised if they came out the same. I love your polite European nature. <laughs> British. <laughs> All right. On that note, I'm going to drop the code for people one more time. Nuchido, N-U-C-H-I-D-O.com slash Dave Asprey. Use discount code Dave10 and you can save some money and look at raising your NAD way more than you probably are today. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to be live and be able to ask questions and things like that, go to ourupgradecollective.com and sign up. You get all sorts of courses. I teach all my books. There's a very active, vibrant community of biohackers who are all working with each other and with me and with a whole team of coaches uh, to help you out. And it's kind of cool to be in the live audience. Everyone who does it keeps coming back. And remember that nuchido.com, N-U-C-H-I-D-O.com, because this is really important. Get your NAD levels up, live longer. It seems like a deal to me. See you guys in the next episode. Mm-hmm.